Kofem Adalaf 105a. Continue our discussion about Bilam. Just getting started. Continue our discussion about Bilam. The Lord is going to tell us some very interesting details about his life, his personality, and um, I don't have anything interpretation wise other than the little translation. So, the floor is open. Floor is open. Please consider, think about it, because it's quite interesting. Okay, so we're at one, two, three, four, five lines from the bottom of the page, and it's the second to last word, Omar Rabbi third to last word. Okay, so some details about Rabbi Echanan, um, Rabbi Echanan, Rabbi Echanan speaking, some details about Bilam's life, personality. Amr Abiyachan Rabbi Abiyachan says, Bilam, Bilam was Chiger Beragle Achas Haya. Bilam was a lame or had a limp in one of his legs. How does he know this? Shanemar, as the verse reads, with respect to Bilam, the Pasuk is in Bamidbar 23 3, Ayelech Shefi. And he went uh, lame. But Shefi is in the singular. The word for lame here is in the singular. And therefore, Bechelen concludes that only one leg was uh, limping. By contrast to, the Gemara is going to quote Shimshin. Shimshin, the famous, uh, famous Samson. Shimshon Agibar, the famous strong one, who uh, fought off the Polishtim single-handedly, was the famous Nazir, and later, when his wife, who ended his Nazirus, he uh, lost his strength and then kept it one more time, and then died while taking down a bunch of, of Polishtim. Philistim. Famous story. Philistines, yeah. So Shimshon, this Shimshon, Bishteid Aglov was lame in both of his feet. So this is quite something. He's a man who's a warrior famous for fighting Polishtim. And I, I don't know how he could walk if he's lame in both feet. I don't know if he walked with two crutches or I, 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 I don't know how this would technically work. But this is what the Gemara says, which is quite uh, something to be thinking about. So how does he get to the conclusion that it's two feet? She never the first reads, Shefifun Ali Oirach Hanaishek Ikve Sus. This is when um, when uh, Yaakov, it's in Bereshis uh, 49, 17, when um, Yaakov is blessing his children, and he blesses Dun. At the end of his life, he's giving his children the blessings and uh, Indicating their future in these blessings, embedded in these in these blessings, and he tells Don that it's like he's going to be a snake that goes in the ground, and then he says Shififun. Shififun is another kind of snake. Um, it's a literal meaning, at least. I saw the translation online. I, I forgot it. Some kind of snake. A Arad. Does that sound right? I looked. I looked online. I can't remember what it is anymore. Like 10 minutes ago, I looked online. Anyway, Shefifun is a kind of snake and it's going on the ground as in it's lacking Maybe legs. Is that you're talking about? That could be it. Yeah. Is that, the, is that a kind of snake? Yeah. What's it? Adder, A-D-D-E-R. There it is. A-D-D-E-R. That's the one I was looking at, yep. Kind of snake. Look it up. But, the, but anyway, the, the uh, word that the Torah used before to describe that we quoted from Bilam being lame in one leg was Shefi. Here it's Shefifun, which literally is translated as this, this kind of snake, adder, but the shefifon could also be read as shefi in plural. So sh if shefi is lame in the singular, then shefifon is plural lame. And thus this blessing, which is talking about Dun, specifically Shimshin, who comes from Dun, the tribe of Dun, then he is shefifon lame in both of his legs. And yet was this great warrior. Okay, I'm you. There he is. There you go. Facts about adders. That's it. The poisonous snake? 
Yes, yeah, what does it say? The death adders of Australia and Oceania, along with the da, da, da. most adders are venomous. Okay. There you go. Because the verse describes it as a snake that bites on the especially heel. Especially dangerous to humans. They are. Not all are, mm. are especially dangerous. Here, the pasuk describes it as a snake that's on the ground, bites the heel, and it's kind of Shimshin who like bit the heel of the fl- the Philistines, and they all come crumbling yeah, down. Guerrilla warfare as well, so like open, but it's uh, yeah. Also, literally, he uh, pushed in the beams, and the whole building came collapsing. So it's like a like, you know, he hit the bottom, and everything came collapsing down. So I, I don't have any reason to believe that this gemara is not literal. I'm just telling you, obviously, there are deeper layers to this gemara, especially considering the fact that he would be lame in both legs, and this great warrior is quite something. So. Floor is open. Anyway, Gemara goes on to describe Bilam. Bilam summa ba'achas me'ena, the third to last line. Bilam was blind in one eye. Shenemar, as the verse reads, shasum ha'ayun. His one eye, in the singular, is open. That's how the Pasuk describes him. So one eye open, <coughs> blind, the other is closed. So he blind in one eye. Well, actually, he's he's um, <coughs> he's describing himself actually as Shasamai, the one with one open eye. And the Gemara continues, Kaisim ba Moslehoya, his way of divining the future, his way of um, um, uh, prophesizing. Sorry, yeah. being a sorcerer, whatever term you want to use, was he would use his reproductive organ. That's what it says. Floors open again. Ksivacha. How do we get to this conclusion? Because here, with respect to Bilam, it says, um, yeah, he's, ta- he's describing himself and introducing his uh, prophecy. He says, uh, the falling one with open eyes. So he's described as the falling one. Okay, so he's the falling one. What does this mean? The f- the what? Falling one. Falling one. Like falling down. What does this falling one mean? So let's find other verses which indicate what the word falling might be. It says the Gemara. Ksiv Hasman says there in the Megillah, where it describes Achashverej getting upset that he hears Haman wants to destroy his wife's people. He goes outside to get some fresh air, comes back inside, and Haman is pleading at the uh, bedside of Esther, probably more a divan, right? That, that half bed. And he falls over. So, Vahine Haman left Lalamita. And behold, Haman is falling over the bed. So we see that the term falling is related to a bed that has a woman. And therefore, if Bilam is describing himself in introducing his prophecy as the falling one, then his prophecy is related to this notion of falling, which is indicated to be associated with a bed. And thus, it's a reference to his organ. And that's how he would do his prophecy. Itmar, the Gemara then comments, so this is all Rabbi Yechanan speaking. A little generation or two later, the similar discussion comes up, and the Gemara says, Itmar as follows in quoting the conversation. Marzutra, Amr Marzutra said, Kaisim ba Masahaya. Marzutra concurred or, or uh, taught that which Rabbi Yechanan said, which is that he would use his organ to divine the future. Marbered Ravina, but Marbered Ravina, which is master son of Ravina, um, I would say that when it says Neufel, well actually, sorry, either in addition to this or in replacement of this idea, I don't know why it's or why it has to be in replacement, it could be in addition, that Shabal Sonai, that he had relations, he had intimate relations with his donkey, which is something we mentioned before. So that's the end of the conversation. Now the Gemara analyzes this conversation. The one who said that he divined with his organ, as we explained before, we, we quoted the verse when we, when Abir Khiran said that teaching. And the one who says that he had relation with his donkey. How does he come to the conclusion? Because here, with respect to Bilam, the verse reads, Kara Shachav, he kneeled and lay down it goes on to say like a lion and like a uh, Kalavi is like a, a young lion who can raise him up to bless him and to curse him. In other words, it's describing his own in- inability to curse. But he describes it, sorry? Like, like referring to the Jewish people. Or 
But he's using that terminology sort of. He's using this terminology to say that he's incapable. His, his praise of the Jewish people is in the fact that he's this incapable of standing up against them. But he describes it as Kirashach of his kneeling and lying. Okay, so that's what it says here. Now, Ksiv Hasim, it says there in Shoftim. I think it's um, uh, Sisra. Sisra and Yael, that, that, that uh, Philistine king and the Jewish woman. Right? So there it says, Ksiv Hasim says, Bein Ragleha Kara. Nafal Shachav. Between her legs, he kneeled, fell, and lay down. So we have this use of intimate relation with respect to kneeling and falling down. And therefore, when Bilam described himself as kneeling and lying down, it's a reference to intimate relations, and therefore concludes Marzutra that he had intimate relation with his donkey. Okay. The Gemara continues, and we're on Kufayim at 105b. The Gemara continues in analyzing some of the verses related to what Bilam said. So Bilam describes himself as das Elyon, the one who knows the knowledge of above, knows divine knowledge, supernal knowledge. This is what he said. The Gemara asks, Hashta das bem Now, considering the fact that we know that Bilam did not know the language or did not know as much of his, as his animal, Das Elyon Havayada, but somehow he knew the knowledge of the supernal knowledge, God's knowledge. He couldn't even figure out his donkey. I mean, say he figured out Hashem. Yeah, okay. Let's let's see. So the Gemara asks, "My Das Behemtai, what do we mean when we say that Bilam couldn't understand his donkey?" So the Gemara says like this: The Amri lay, because the donkey said to him, "Right, he's having a conversation with his donkey," and the Gemara is going to interpolate the verse that talks that describes that conversation he had with his donkey. And add some flavor to it that indicates that his donkey bested him, or outsmarted, outwitted him. I'm relay the people asked them actually. They, they, they said, "Why do you?" Yeah, I'm but the rest of the Gemara is going to be about his donkey, actually. No, no, the, I'm relay the first question is by the, the first, yes, but the rest is his donkey. Yeah, the Gemara is going to go on. Yeah. They said, "You're a great person. Why? Why do you yeah. a horse so you go faster again?" So, um, all of this is going to lead to the fact that he couldn't outsmart his donkey, and therefore, why would we assume that he knew the knowledge of Hashem? She says in work this, the Amri lay, because people told him, my time will let a have to you. Why didn't you ride a horse? You're riding a donkey. Donkeys are slower. It's a poor man's riding, right? When we describe Mashiach coming, right, this, there's probably a connection there, but when we describe Mashiach as coming, describe, at least in one state, as a poor man riding a donkey. So the donkey is the poor way to travel. Why aren't you riding a horse? Amr lahu. So Bilam told the people, Shadoy lay beretive. I have them, but they're grazing in the field. They're, 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 um, they're eating grass. They're enjoying life. So Amalei, so the donkey now said to Bilam, interjecting, like undermining his explanation, I'm your donkey. Meaning, you always take me. What are you talking about? You have, a, you have horses, but they're busy now. You always drive with me. What are, you, what are you making up stories? So he said, Oh, Latina Ba'alma. Whenever the donkey speaks, it's actually the verse. And the Gemara's interpolating with Bilam's response. So the donkey says, I'm your donkey. What do you mean you you have horses? So he says, Oh, Latina Ba'alma, the, the donkey, you're just to carry my bags. So he says, I share a but you're you're riding on me. So he says, I cry Ba'alma, it so happened I'm, I'm riding on you, Bilam says. So the donkey says, But but From always till now, you've always been riding on me. But like, hey, moreover, the donkey continues. We go back a long way. You go back a long way. There's another one for Mr. Goddard. We go yeah. back a long way. Come on. But not only do you always ride with me, Halashin Oisin Lach Maisa Ishus, Balila. But we have uh, intimate relation. We have marital relate. Uh, I, I do with you the ways of women. That's literally translation. At in, at nights. How do we know this? Because Ksiv Hacha morning. Ksiv Hacha says here. Hahaskein hiskanti. Um, the literal meaning is that have I betrayed you? But the term is a u- unique one, which has the root word is this, the root word of this word is samach chaf nun. And the Gemara is not going to compare it to somewhere else where that same root word indicates um, marital relations. Namely, Ksiv Hasim it says there. I think it's Avishag. Yes? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. 
keep that with warm when he was getting it. Yeah. That he loy seichanas, and she was to him a seichanas, a a companion. But the companion here, the root word is sin chaf, no sama chaf non, which indicates intimate relations. And therefore, when the donkey says, "Have I betrayed you?" but using this term sama chaf non, it could be indicating intimate relations. Like is the organization that takes care of uh, well. the yeah. Yeah, from this. Yeah? Yeah. Take care of him. Yeah. The interesting is also that Sakana comes from that as well. Danger. Like the the one, okay, yeah. It's a danger when you get too cozy with something, basically. But you rely on Hashem, not so much on people. What's the translation of Sakhnut? The way that's used in Israel is for the, that organization? I think it means support. Support, support. yeah, like the government support, support for the support. Yeah. different welfare agencies and yeah. so on. So, this is the end of the conversation. All to say that the donkey completely outsmarted Bilam. And yet, the Gemara, the, yet the Torah says, and this is a truth, that Bilam knew the knowledge of Hashem. So how is that possible? So therefore the Gemara concludes, Elamai ve'yodah das elyon. What's this? Use? So there must be something unique, one particular piece of information that he has about the divine that's working to his advantage. So what is that? Because it couldn't just be because he knows everything of the divine, because he couldn't even outsmart his donkey. So it says to come more like this. I just thought of something that might be a possible explanation to this conversation. We have to flesh it out. I'll share with I'll share with you the kernel, and we'll see if we can flesh it out. Something that dawned on me because we talked about it. We made the relationship, we made the connection to Mashiach's donkey and just reminded me of something. So what was this piece of divine information they did have? Because so, he knew how to determine that moment, that God is upset or angry. There's a moment when God's anger is um, exposed and he knew that moment and he wanted to curse the Jews at that moment. The Gemara concludes, behind the Carmel and the Yisrael. And this is what the prophet tells the Jewish people many generations later. This is in the book of Micha. Ami, my people, Zacharna, remember, Mayyad's Balak, Melach Mayav, what Balak, the king of Mayav, consulted in hiring Balam. And what that Balam, son of Ba'or, responded from the, from the city of Shittim to Gilgal, meaning cross the land. Laman das Sitkis Hashem. To know the righteousness of Hashem. So, what's the righteousness of Hashem that's being known here in Bilam's situation that the, that the prophet's indicating? Based on above, we know the answer. How's that? What does this verse mean when it says, the prophet says, to know the righteousness of Hashem? So this explains the Gemara. God is telling the people, the Jewish people, no. Please, you know, please know. How much righteousness I did with you. I withheld my anger all those days. In other words, there's a specific time when God's anger is available. And for that time, I withheld that. Maybe Bilam Rasha throughout the time of Bilam's life, because he knew how to find that time. And if he knew it and used it, it would be a bad situation. And therefore, I withheld it. As, I, as the Gabbara explains, as God explains. Had I been angry during one of those times, and Bilam would grab that opportunity to curse the Jewish people in Ishtar, Mesanein, Sheisrael, Shara, Deplit, there would not um, remain one refuge of the haters of the Jews. It's a euphemism for the Jews themselves. And this is the meaning of a Balam, told Balak. Bilam tells the, uh, the king, Ma akev like kava kel. How can I curse that which God does not allow me to curse? Okay, so before we go further, I just want to just share with you the kernel that I thought of. Um, when we talked about Mashiach coming riding on the donkey, I don't know if you remember, but we talked about this idea that the word for donkey in Hebrew is chamar. Excuse me. And the word chamar also means material, as in materialism, physical world. I explained that Mashiach's job, or the ultimate coming of Mashiach, is when the physical is transformed and elevated. So maybe what the Gemara is saying is, how could he have knowledge of Hashem if he can't even master the materialism? He can't even overcome his base urges of materialism. He can't tra- if he can't transform materialism, how could you, how could you say you have a supernal knowledge? 
Supernal knowledge and connect, connection to Hashem only comes through transforming our physical life, and Bilam failed at that. So what's the one thing he could do? Is the little opening on the other end, is God's anger. Maybe that's what the Gemara means here. I'm just wondering if we can flesh it out somehow to make all the details of the conversation yeah, fit with this idea. And the one leg, he only goes in one direction. Like usually, if you have mean or small, he's only going on the small. Very good. He has a good sit track. So he has a gift. So I assume should have no legs? No, Shim is probably something else. It means that, uh, I looked look, look it up, I think it means that um, he has strength was in his arm. But Hashem made it purposely that way. She, people should realize he's still human. He has uh, limitations in what he, can, what he can do, but his uh, strength was in his... Uh, Okay, it's on the literal level. I'm saying if we're going with this, in other words, if we're going with this idea that Bilam has blind in one eye and in one leg, as if to say he's one track complete, mind. one track minded, uh, invested in enjoying materialism rather than elevating it and besting it, as it were. Yeah. And using then what and Shimshin losing both of his legs would mean that he completely transcends the idea of materialism? I don't know. Maybe. The that he completely transcends the idea of materialism. It's completely irrelevant to him. Maybe. Or maybe. Uh, so I want to see the commentary, but just I know Bill, they talk about this idea that with one track mind and one direction because they're in midrashim that bring this afraid that in terms of nevuah he's even greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah. So the question is how you talk and how's it possible? The answer is he had he has certain gifts. If he were developed them for good, it would have been tremendous. But had he bested so, his materialism, it might have been elevated. To me, it's a very wonderful lesson what they call in the secular world the evil genius. That is our Hashem gives chokhmah to goyim and uh, and they have a tremendous genius to do things. But it can be unfortunately the wrong way. in a terrible way, as we see in history in the twentieth century. And, yeah. uh, and so even people that are quotation marks appear spiritual, like even the church had maybe some good ideas, but eventually it gets corrupted. And we see that that, that Rambam develops that idea. Yeah, but even more if you take that even they, to it's even uh, worse because Bilam at least was clear as an idolater, but here the, in the other religions they, they kind of mix the, the tarot. If you take it to its kabbalistic con- conclusion, which we talked about here before, is that uh, Avedizar doesn't not have spirituality, yeah. but spirituality doesn't equal good. That's right. It can be bad spirituality. And here's a good example of Bilam. We took uh, exactly. Bilam with, uh, okay, so now let's see what's this anger business. But this is what we did before. It's Gemara Brachas. So it's like we did have this Gemara before. Yeah, Gemara said Gemara Brachas with the, the, with the Rega the one time and. Uh, oh, this Gemara coming up? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, yes, that's correct. The whole thing is well, so it's all part of this Gemara Brachas. That, uh, I'm thinking that the discussion between him, him and the donkey about the horses mm-hmm. is um, kind of a way, maybe a metaphorical way of saying, you know, you you think that you have an independence. You can go on a horse and go in this direction, that direction. At the end of the day, you're stuck with, <laughs> you're with me all the time. You're and then Hashem basically directs everything that comes out of your... You may think you have independence in what you want to say, but at the end of the day, Hashem will, uh-huh. will use your mouth the way He wants you to use your mouth. So don't think you can just get on a horse and ride into the sunset, you know, because you don't. I was thinking you're a different just, way. You're living in another, you know, in a, in a uh-huh. reality that doesn't exist, Mr. Billum. That's very good. I was actually thinking you were going, you were going to go a different direction. That um, he was saying, I have horses, I can do whatever I want. And, I, and the donkey saying, no, you're a slave to your materialism. Yeah, uh, same idea. You're a slave to the hamar. You're, right. you're a slave to your... Your, your, your base urges have complete control over you. Right, right, right. right. To the point that you're willing to be intimate with it. Right. That's the flip side of what I was saying. You're talking about his base urges, and I'm talking about... What oh, from Hashem's perspective, from saying... Perspective. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, very good. Shkaya, thank you for that. That's very good. Okay, so let's see. What's the what's the business with this uh, with this anger? It says the Gemara like this. The verse reads in Tehillim seven twelve, El Zoyim B'chol Yoyim, God who's angry every day. So at least once a day, God's angry. Kama how long is this anger? Rega a moment. Shenema as the verse reads. Kireba gaba apoy for one moment of his anger. Chaim Bertzayna his life. I'm sorry, his will, desire, is for life, is forever. So it's one moment of, desi- of anger, positivity, forever. Just translate it more literally, I'll explain in a minute. A boy is Ema, another, if you'd like, you can suggest another proof for this idea that Shem's anger is in a moment. From uh, this verse is in Isaiah 26, 20, which says, Leich Ami, go my people, I guess the prophet speaking, and he says, Baba Chadrich, Chadrecha, go into your rooms. V'segur dal chasecha, dal lesecha ba'decha, and ha- close the doors behind you. Chavi, hide yourselves. Kamat rega for at least one for one moment. Ad yaver zam, waiting for God's mo- anger to pass. Here's what the Gemara says. What does this mean? God's anger is for a moment. And the big question is, God doesn't change. And Yeshem leishen nisiam, God doesn't change. So what's He changing from anger to happy? From anger to happy every day, He's changing. 
So I haven't seen the question discussed and related to the anger specifically, but a similar question is asked in Chassidus about uh, holidays and Shabbos. Especially in Chassidus and Kabbalah where we understand that every Yom Tov and Shabbos is not just a, a day in the year of, or the fact that on the halacha calendar a person has to behave a certain way is a reflection of the fact that in, there is a spiritual truth, there is a spiritual divine energy that is invested on Shabbos and Yom Tov which gives it a, makes it a holy day. So what happens? Hashem changed from Friday to Shabbos and then what happens? Divine energy in Canada is now and in Eretz Yisrael it's somewhere else because Shabbos comes in at a different time. So what's going on? So explain this. These truths always exist. They always exist. Each of these truths, of these spiritual truths on a different level. And then there are certain times when the window opens up for us to experience it. Barrier, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, in other words, but they always exist. Yeah. So I'll give you a story which indicates what, we're, what I'm talking about. I think I'm, I think I'm, maybe I want to... Like a window or a curtain, like Hashem is always there. Something the curtain. That's right. So Hashem's anger is always there and Hashem, Shabbos is, always exists in heaven and Yom Tov always exists in heaven. The question is when we have the window to access that. Same with Tshuva, like Tshuva, for example. Same thing. Hashem, Tshuva is always available. Tshuva is always available, but it's easier, more easier. The, That's the right. windows open and the, the screen. Right. So there's a very tiny little moment on it every day when there's, when this anger is in, in, in like, you know, a window into this into Hashem's anger as it were and the balance between all these things is what keeps the world running as we know it I mean the balance of our connection to these things so I'll just give it a, a story that indicates this is a famous story I think it was the students of the Basham I could be wrong about this but it was a group of Hasidic students who were wondering if they truly feel Shabbos the holiness of Shabbos or are they just feeling their preparation meaning because they got ready for Shabbos and they sing the Shabbos tunes and they're wearing the Shabbos clothing and they have a Shabbos meal. So is it all the physical ambience or is the real holiness of Shabbos they're feeling? How do they know if, what, which one it is? So it's hard to do a test. They're going to behave like Shabbos on Wednesday. One week they're going to do all the preparations Tuesday afternoon for Shabbos <laughs> and start Shabbos on Wednesday night. Anyway, it comes midday on Wednesday and they start to feel something. So they start feeling bad about themselves because they're feeling Shabbos. That means that they're, means on Shabbos not feeling, they're, re- they're not really feeling Shabbos. They're feeling their own so they came complaining to their Rebbe. And their Rebbe told him, did you notice that on Wednesday afternoon there was a young man who walked into your shul? He said, yes. He said, this young man is a tzaddik. And he walked in, he lives in Shabbos mode 24-7. And he walked in, he brought Shabbos with him. And you were feeling his Shabbos. All to say that Shabbos always exists. And just on once a week, Hashem gives us access to that, to that level. But in theory, a person could be there all the time. So the same thing would seem to be true about this moment of anger, which we'll talk about more tomorrow, when that is and how that is and how it could be used and how it shouldn't be used. Um, but the same thing is true. Hashem's anger does, Hashem doesn't change. It always exists. But in a very, very minimal amount of time every day, it's exposed uh, and injected into this world. And as I mentioned, that's, word, that's what keeps the world in balance. The world has to have a certain percentage of all the divine elements. Otherwise, the world collapses. Yeah, For too much kindness, it uh, people, there's chaos and too much uh, anger and it's too survive, strict and no one will survive. No survive so yeah. there's like, uh, there's a balance and these little, yeah. little interjection here and here of all the different divine elements yeah. will keep the world in balance and therefore once a day for a little moment there is that anger. But Bill of knowing when that was, that was the danger. Good knowing how to Hashem overuse it. The guessing for as a parent, the same thing. Okay. Guessing for, for children. If you're too kind and they have chaos in the house, if you're too strict right. then no one can survive. Yeah. So if, therefore oh, the message is yeah, yeah, exactly. a, fa- a parent has to have a little bit of anger. Exactly. But it should be so tiny but, that the yeah. children don't even know when it is. Exactly. <laughs> or even, Beth Rama says, even they appear to be angry. Appear to be, yeah. Right. And same with the teacher and the student, the same thing. Yeah. Because it's uh, our Rebbe and it's Helmi and our Rebbe, our Rebbe, our Rebbe, and it's a Hasid, the same thing. Yeah. If you're too strict, you can't go on. If you're too lenient, it's chaos. Yeah. Right, have a wonderful day, buddy. Okay.